Hello, I'm Professor Matthew Schmidt, and this is Genetics. In this whole session, we've been going through this idea about mutations uh, and the nature of the gene, and it's getting a little philosophical. It is philosophical. Uh, through the work of Beadle and Tatum, for example, and Benzer that we saw last time, um, and what we're going to see this time, we're really getting closer and closer and closer to a both a structural and functional definition of the gene. This particular session is about complementation testing. I think you'll find it cool, and it really does allow us to get an idea which sort of mixes structure and function together, which of course they're always one in, in a very real sense. It's just that we do experiments to get at the function, we do different experiments to get at the structure. So let's see what this complementation testing is all about and what it can tell us. So what complementation really allows us to ask is, say, if you're going along in order, with Benzer, we saw two mutations, I should say two mutants, that have exactly the same phenotype, right? Now, he asked the question, are those mutations physically, structurally in the same location? And often found out that they weren't. Now we want to know, are those two mutations located in the same gene, or in a different gene. Now this may strike you as odd to begin with, but here's the thing. In bacteria in particular, and bacterial viruses, uh, genes that operate in the same pathway tend to be located physically right next to each other. And in addition, we've seen before, like with Beetle and Tatum, that most biochemical, pa uh, I was gonna say something redundant, most reactions controlled by enzymes, for example, do occur in a sort of a stepwise pathway type of a, a fashion. So you can understand if there was one gene that made this gene product and another gene that made this gene product, say they're both necessary for, in this case, lysis, well, if one gene wasn't working, you'd have a mutant that looked the same as if the other gene wasn't working, or if neither of them were working, right? So. The genetic complementation test here tells us if two mutants with the same phenotype are located in the same gene or in different ones in a functional way. So Benzer was still involved with this. He asked, now you'll know the reason if you were following along why I was saying the R2 region. He originally said it was a gene, but the question is this whole R2 area where he was mapping mutations, is it in fact a single gene, or does it contain more than one functional unit, which is a gene? In bacteria, the term cistron is often used to mean the equivalent of gene, in case you see that, all right? So let's do a cross. I just made it up, R2 number 22, because remember he had a lot of them, times R2, 49. They both have the same phenotype, right? We could do a cross and look for recombinants and see what the map distance between the two is, but here we're going to do something a little bit different. If a lot of plaques form, remember plaques mean progeny, we say that these mutations have complemented each other because um, if they're mutants, uh, I missed out uh, one very important part here. Strain K, mutants don't grow, right? So what we're looking to do is reconstitute wild types, sort of like we did before but we'll see what the difference is. If you see loads of plaques, remember what we saw before, like three. I'm talking about all over the place. We say they've complemented each other, and we'll see what that means in a second. If no plaques or tiny, tiny bit do form, we say that they have failed to complement each other. So what the heck does that mean? Well, this is in retrospect, but it's easier to understand if we do it a little bit in retrospect. It turns out that what we have called the R2 region, what Benzer called it, really does in fact consist of two genes, two functional units, which after this was discovered, were then called R2A and R2B, because they were part of the R2 region, the rapid lysis, re rapid lysis region. So we have gene A and gene B. And it turns out that each of them, as I was implying before, makes a particular gene product, a different one, necessary for the normal lysis pathway. So don't worry about what's exactly going on, but the pathway means that there's some, uh, some, I don't want to say if it's a step or if it's a thing 
or a process. But the point is that the R2A gene product is necessary for, make some, for making something happen, from going to point one to point two. And the R2B gene is necessary for catalyzing whatever it is that allows you to go from there to lysis. You need both of them for normal lysis to occur. Now here's the idea. As long as there's one good copy of both genes, wild type plaques will grow without intragenic recombination. This is so important. Last time we saw some wild type plaques getting regenerated by intragenic recombination, right? That's because we were reconstituting one functional gene because of uh, crossovers, and that occurred at a very low frequency. If you have two good copies of the gene, you're getting wild type pretty much all the time. So let's look at two situations uh, that have to do with complementation. Now that we know that there's an R2A gene and R2B gene, if so I say the situation over here is mutants are in fact in different genes. If they are, complementation will occur, and let's see why. So what I'm saying is in green here, I've shaded in the R2A gene, which is part of the R2 region. And in purple, we have the R2B gene. So if it's true that R2 mutant 22 is located in fact in the R2A gene, that means that gene's not going to work too well, right? If the R2B mutant, sorry, if the R249 mutant is located in the R2B gene, uh, that gene's not going to be able to work on its own. But if you do a co-infection of these two strains, look what happens. Without any crossing over, you guys, there is one totally good functioning R2A gene, right? And there is one totally fine functioning R2B gene. We say that they're in trans in the sense that it doesn't really matter what's attached to what. As long as they're both in the cell, this one makes its product, this one makes its product. Really, I should have drawn it to go up there. Lysis will happen normally, right? So that's the proof they're in two different genes because look over here. If they were in the same gene, you'd have failure to complement, and I think you'll see why. If R2 mutant 22 and 49 are just at two different places in the R2A gene, and you do a co-infection, yeah, you've got great R2B gene products all around, but you're never getting a functional R2A gene, and that means no complementation. Now, you might be thinking something true, which is that what if there was intragenic recombination in there? That's possible, and if it occurred, you would see some wild-type plaques, but they would be at a minute fraction of the ones you would see in the situation with complementation, okay? Now, so let's uh, summarize some of this. If both mutations are in the same gene, no functional product will ever be formed from that gene, so no wild-type plaques will be observed, barring that intragenic recombination. If both mutations are in different genes, a functional R2A product will be produced. A functional R2B product will be produced. In that case, all the phages will be wild type and therefore able to lyse the cell. Wild type plaques, that's it. Now just, I said this already, but just for the record, if two different mutations are in the same gene, a very small amount of wild type progeny may be produced by the intragenic recombination we were discussing last time. It's a different phenomenon. It's, I say it's not easy to confuse with complementation. What I mean is in your brain it may be easy to confuse, although I hope this has really straightened it out. But my point is when you're doing the experiments, you're not sort of like which, which one is going on. If, it's, if you think of the data we had last time, we saw 0 0.06 map units, meaning out of 10,000 uh, offspring phage, like three of them were wild type. I'm saying that you would see all 10,000 of them growing on uh, the relevant strain if there's complementation. So when you're really doing the experiments, this doubt does not come into uh, your thinking. So just to reiterate it finally, what we're, I put the pathway on the top here and... Mm -hmm.